UFO Armada Invades NT. The truth is out there. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Not if the Northern Territory News can help it, it's not. Welcome to Media Watch. I'm Jonathan Holmes. It's a dangerous place, the Territory. Crocs in the water, aliens in the air. And the Territory's only daily reckons they're both worth regular front-page splashes. Especially in recent months, UFOs. For example, in June, fisherman Simon Moyle, his son and their mate Eddie Carroll told the NT News that... They spotted an object zip across the sky and burst into fire around 5.30pm on Sunday. Mr Carroll, quite sensibly, told the paper... It looked like a falling star. I think it was a meteor. It was too high to be a plane. But that explanation didn't seem to satisfy the NT News reporter. Mr Carroll told Media Watch... The guy doing the newspaper article kept asking me, what was it? What do you think it was? It was like he wanted me to say the words UFO. I kept saying I have no idea. Well, the NT News didn't have a doubt in the world what to call it. Fishos catch sight of UFO. The very next day, the big one hit the news' front page. UFOs invade NT town. It was a rip snorter. Malinja resident Janie Dixon told the news about a strange red light accompanied by an earth-shaking noise. The thing came closer, circled around the basketball courts and then came so close above our house. The UFO hovered over their house for a couple of hours, said Janie Dixon. The NT News couldn't resist the obvious comparison. Was it like this? A scene from Steven Spielberg's classic movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Ms Dixon has told Media Watch that the news's account of her close encounter was absolutely accurate. Fair enough. But for weeks since then, the news has been plying its readers with distant encounters of the blurry photo kind. Not that that has cramped its style. Take this front page from a month ago. UFO Armada invades NT. Could the Northern Territory be under attack from an armada of UFOs? Well, of course it could. But readers might want a teensy bit more evidence that the war of the worlds has begun than a few blurry pictures that... ...have ranged from dark discs flying in broad daylight to strange lights glowing in the night sky. And could well be a lens flare, a microlight plane and a weather balloon. Last week, the news had yet another front-page lead. Another mass UFO sighting. According to one of six witnesses at an outback station... This strange light was coming straight for us, over the house. On its website, the news illustrated the piece with a butte picture of little green men. NT News editor Julian Ritchie tells Media Watch that all references to alien invasions are... Clearly tongue-in-cheek. The paper, he says, has been faithfully reporting eyewitness accounts of unidentified flying objects. And for the benefit of effete southerners like us, he helpfully explains... It might be like a skivvy-wearing media watch researcher telling a colleague that they thought they saw a Saab convertible drive past while they were drinking their skinny soy latte and stroking their toy poodle at a Double Bay coffee shop. Without scientific proof, does their colleague believe them or not? I reckon they would. In fact, I reckon there'd be a headline in it. Sydney siders shocked by Swedish invasion. Actually, what really excites Sydney siders, as everyone knows, is property. And these days, rents. It's undeniably hard to find somewhere in Sydney to rent these days. And last week, the Daily Telegraph's Janet Five Yeomans revealed a great statistic. Just 739 homes for rent in all of Sydney. Exclusive. That amazing figure came from the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. As so often, it was simply regurgitated, no questions asked, by the radio talk shows. 739 homes is the figure, and that is hard to believe, but staggering. According to the papers today, there's only 739 properties available in Sydney... Seven News that night also swallowed the story whole and gave the Real Estate Institute a nice platform. Fewer than 800 rentals are available across Sydney. And if there's something like five or 6,000 people, obviously 6,000 people don't move into uh, 749 homes. 
According to your own institute, Steve, it's 739. But the figure is clearly rubbish, as others, notably on that night's ABC News, were pointing out. The figure of 700 or so is, is far too low. Um, I'd be extremely surprised at that. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, there are around 450,000 residential rental properties in Sydney. Even if the vacancy rate is as low as 1.2%, as the Real Estate Institute claims, that would mean some 5,400 vacant properties. But one reputable property research agency told ABC News there were far more than that available. Our numbers suggest there's actually over 20,000 in Sydney. Uh, we believe the vacancy rate is actually 3.6%. And Mr Christopher has pointed out to Media Watch that property websites list many thousands of Sydney properties to let. And yet on Thursday, Janet Five Yeomans blithely reused the Real Estate Institute's figure as if it were gospel. Greedy landlords have been warned not to exploit Sydney's dire rental squeeze, where desperate tenants are vying for only 739 rental properties across the whole city. MediaWatch asked the Daily Telegraph if it had made any attempt to verify the figure. Editor David Pempathy replied... The Real Estate Institute is the peak property body in Australia and its figures are consistently relied on without question by every media outlet for news. If there is a credibility issue here and the REI overcooked its numbers, it's more for them to explain than us. Which is pretty gobsmacking. The REI isn't the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It's a lobby group for real estate agents with a big axe to grind. It's pushing the new Premier, Nathan Rees, to reduce stamp duty and property taxes, with some success, according to the telly's original story. A spokesman for Mr Rees said that they had already been in touch with the Institute to arrange a meeting and to listen to their suggestions. Not surprising, given the hysteria whipped up by the Institute's shonky figures and the willingness of the telly and a lot of the rest of Sydney's media to use them without question. The Institute, by the way, which is happy enough to dish out its press releases, declined to tell Media Watch how it reached its remarkable figures. Over at the City Morning Herald, they've been busy this week promoting a shopping bag. The marketing folk at the Herald have been running a slick ad on the telly with its free bag digitally draped over lots of famous arms and shoulders. This Saturday, don't miss your free reusable Enviro bag. Cool, eh? But what was the Herald thinking when it ran this ad in the paper last Thursday? Don't be seen without your free Life's Calling Enviro bag. The pick is of Matt Brown, who was, very briefly, New South Wales Police Minister, before being forced to resign in ignominy last month after revelations about party games at Parliament House. I've tendered my resignation because I behaved in a way not fitting or befitting a minister. Before and after that unhappy press conference, Mr Brown chose to carry his two-year-old niece Ruby in his arms. Not surprisingly, many papers, The Age Online, for example, used that image to illustrate the story. Minister quits over pants prank. Much less excusably, the Sydney Morning Herald chose the same picture for its ad, with its silly bag digitally draped over little Ruby's shoulder. It thoughtfully added, in very small print, Matt Brown does not endorse the life's calling Enviro bag. I'll bet he doesn't. But more to the point, Ruby's parents didn't endorse the use of their daughter to advertise a shopping bag or anything else. Her father, James Hamilton, sent a statement to MediaWatch. At no stage did either I or my partner give permission for the image of my daughter to be used in the advertisement or for any other purpose. The Herald tells Media Watch that when Ruby's parents complained, it immediately withdrew the ad. But it should never have run it in the first place. James Hamilton says... I am devastated, sad and angry at the invasion of my daughter's privacy and the exploitation of her vulnerability for commercial purposes. Some other folk have had their privacy invaded this week by those guardians of the nation's security, the Australian Federal Police, who've been busy raiding the homes of journalists and leakers. Canberra Times reporter Phil Dawling wrote a story last June which revealed that... China, North and South Korea and Australia's close ally, Japan, 
are priority targets for Australian intelligence, according to classified briefing papers prepared for Defence Minister Joel Fitzgibbon. Last week, the federal Rosers arrived without warning at Dawling's Canberra home, armed with search warrants. National security secrets had been leaked. No doubt ministers and mandarins were annoyed. The raid certainly annoyed the Canberra Times, its owner Fairfax Media and Mr Dawling, who declared... Its intention is to broadcast a very loud message to public servants and people in general to warn them off speaking to the press. I'm sure he's right. But given that these were classified briefing papers relating to Australian intelligence operations, there's at least some excuse for the Defence Department wanting to find out who leaked them. There's none at all for the second AFP raid last week. This one on the Gold Coast followed a couple of stories by the Australian's Mark Day about the possible effects of cutbacks at ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority. ACMA staff say the closure of the offices and consequent staff reductions will make it impossible to ensure digital TV transmissions are properly planned. The closure of ACMA field offices was foreshadowed in a memo to staff, a copy of which has been obtained by the Australian. Life-threatening stuff. ACMA put out a press release denying the main points of the story next day. But then, last Thursday, six of the AFP's finest got involved. Police in leak raid over TV story. The Australian understands that the detective spent four hours combing the Gold Coast home of someone they suspect of leaking information to this newspaper. ACMA tells MediaWatch that it referred the incident to the federal police because the leak was a criminal matter. Section 70 of the Crimes Act also prohibits a Commonwealth officer from publishing or communicating to another person any fact or information which it was their duty not to disclose. We've had this one before this year. Because ACMA is a public authority under the Commonwealth, the law says its employees can be sent to prison for up to two years for leaking the most innocuous information. Staff who leak from a private sector organisation... Telstra, for example, can be sacked or even sued. But they certainly don't have the cops turning up at their homes. Four months ago, the Prime Minister said this. Labor is committed to a culture of greater disclosure and transparency in government. There's been much talk about whistleblower protection and shield laws for journalists. But I suggest a good start would be to repeal Section 70 of the Crimes Act so that bureaucrats at places like ACMA no longer have the power or as they would no doubt claim the duty to make Australia feel like Stasiland. Join me again next week.